Association. Good afternoon. It's been a long day. My name is Lou Ritter, and I'm here to speak on behalf of the American E-Liquid Manufacturing Standards Association, or AIMSA. I hold the office of president in this recently incorporated association. Uh, my involvement is as a volunteer, and I do not, I am not a vendor, and I do not have any financial in, interest in this industry. Our members are all listed on our website in a matter of public record. AIMS is a newly formed trade association for e-liquid manufacturers. E-liquids as a component of e-cigarette use vaporized and inhaled are an issue of relevance. AIMS was initiated and formation facilitated by consumers. Our association has articles of incorporation as a nonprofit filed in the state of Ohio. An exemption application has been submitted to the IRS. Let's see why isn't this change? There we go. Um, AIMSA self-regulated standards posted on our website focus on accuracy of content, quality of ingredients, professional and appropriate manufacturing environments, professional and appropriate packaging, and transparency. Electronic cigarettes are one category of innovative products as referenced by the FDA 2012 N114 docket notice summary. Some estimates indicate over 5 million people around the world are already using um, e-cigarettes and these products as tobacco harm reduction alternative to smoking. Some estimates indicate a $2 billion global market with the U.S. holding the largest share. Hundreds of thousands supportively participate in a global community. Multiple internet industry forums and online programming. Three professional trade associations here in the U.S. Um, more in other countries. CASA, over 250 vendors here in the U.S books getting published, and more are all prime examples. All focus on disseminating educational information, supportiveness, encouragement to this profound tobacco harm reduction alternative. On the IMSA website, we've posted some links to some profound current research performed by one leading cardiologist, Dr. Konstantinos Farsalanos, Clearstream Project, and more. E-cig vapor is proving to be exponentially less harmful than tobacco smoke. Please see the links on our website for the details of these studies and other relevant information. Research studies are showing exponential reduction in the consumed harmful chemicals. For example, the most almost undetectable nitrosamine levels. Since the introduction of electronic cigarettes, we are unaware of any deaths or even any illnesses resulting from the use of these products from direct or secondhand exposures. There are uncountable numbers of stories expressing how profoundly these products are positively impacting lives. To my understanding, nicotine is an alkaloid found in the nightshade family of plants, Solanaceae, that acts as a nicotonic acetylcholine agonist. The biosynthesis takes place in the roots and accumulation occurs in the leaves of the Solanaceae. It constitutes approximately only 0.6 to 3% of the dry weight of tobacco and is present in the range of two to seven micrograms per kilogram of various edible plants. Given this minimal constitution and the existence in other nightshade plants, some commonly consumed, it raises the question, is nicotine equal to tobacco? Granted, in its concentrated form, nicotine is toxic and certainly justifies controlled and professional handling in environments. However, in the diluted concentration consumed by e-cig users, the risks are exponentially reduced and often considered comparable to caffeine. Referencing code, US Code 2010, Title 21, subsection 387, delineates the definitions for tobacco and its subcomponents. We wonder how electronic cigarettes fit these definitions of tobacco and or tobacco products. We believe that if the products and or their components do not fit the definitions of tobacco, perhaps e-liquids deserve a new approach to regulation. Let's address some of your real and substantive questions. 4.4a asks, how should the harm be identified and measured? Well, for THR purposes, tobacco harm reduction purposes, in direct comparison to combusting and smoking tobacco, Dr. Farsalonos' study shows comparative plasma nicotine levels. 
the comparative absence of nitrosamines, carbon monoxides, and, other th and thousands of other harmful chemicals verify the reduced harm factors. 4.5 asks, what barriers exist to the development and marketing approval? My answer would be the looming threat of unreasonable, unrealistic, and unsustainable regulation is by far the most significant barrier. 4.6 asks, uh, how can the FDA and other HHS agencies act to protect and promote public health? The FDA can work with industry-related associations like AMSA, CASA, and others, as well as other industry-knowledgeable and competent activists to formulate and establish reasonable, realistic, and sustainable regulations for the manufacture and sale of refillable e-liquid products. Different nicotine products carry substantially different risks. The FDA can educate people about these significant differences. 4.7 asks, how can these broader outcomes be taken into account? Competent professional research has been conducted and continues. These professionals are willing to share their information and results. Dr. Farsalanos and the ClearStream Project would be two likely sources. There are many others who have substantive libraries of accumulated research. CASA, Dr. Michael Siegel, Bill Godshaw, all come to mind. AMSA is more than willing to participate. The harm smoking tobacco causes both first and second hand is obviously unquestionable. We already have substantive implications for electronic cigarettes to scientifically prove themselves a profound harm reduction alternative, as most e-cig users are already learning for themselves. We implore this committee to advocate for reasonable, realistic, and sustainable regulations for the manufacture and sale of these refillable e-liquid products. We are now presented with a rare opportunity. We have the technology, means, education, and the wisdom to offer this substantial tobacco harm reduction alternative. Yes, more research is clearly warranted and justified. However, to risk even diminution of this profound harm reduction alternative with overregulation would be a true injustice. While abstinence is clearly the preferred and healthiest alternative, the addictive realities proven by relapse statistics and continued harm experienced by smokers and all of us touched in one way or another by those harms are absolutely undeniable. The axiom quit or die, spoken or implied, has proven unviable and inhumane. We as a society have not only created the harms of tobacco, we have permitted them to endure for decades or longer, and we've done so through governmental regulations. Now, through this very same regulatory process, we have a very real opportunity to mitigate some of that harm. Don't we owe it to our society and all of humanity to lead the way and facilitate this tobacco harm reduction alternative? AIMSA offers to assist with, contribute to, and facilitate the development of reasonable, realistic, and sustainable regulations for the manufacture and sale of e-liquid products. Thank you all for your time and attention. And I appreciate this opportunity to present this information. If you have any questions. Thank you. Um, you made a statement, I think, that said uh, that you're not aware of any illnesses or deaths. Um, how, how, by what mechanism would you become aware of this information? How do you, how do you, how do you? Uh, garner this kind of information about these products? Well, I was a very honest statement. I said, we are not aware. We're active in the industry. We're very actively involved in following the forums and following the news. We have consumer advocate associations. Um, we have people that are putting together documentary films um, that are traveling the world doing interviews. We have direct access to some of the people doing some of the most leading medical research in this field. And so far, we have not seen a single report. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But to our awareness, being pretty well dug into this industry, we have yet to hear of any. So I think my statement was true and honest. And uh, can I have a better understanding, I guess, of the time span over which these products 
uh, have been actively used in so, the United States. To the best of my knowledge, they made their preliminary introduction in the United States about six years ago. And they have just absolutely exploded exponentially since then. As I said, we've, to our count, we've got over 250 vendors of various natures here in the United States. And can you, can you give me some kind of an understanding of the, um, when somebody picks up a cigarette for the first time, starts to smoke, or you have a population that does that, how, over that period of time, say three years, four years, five years, whatever it is, um, how, how much illness and death does one see during that period of time of smoking cigarettes? Would you have any way of comparing that to what you might expect to see with your e-cigarettes? I can't speak to what the population experiences. I'm not the population. I can tell you my personal experience. As my personal experience, I did smoke cigarettes for 33 years. I have not touched a cigarette in over two and a half years. Yes, I have held someone in my arm as they took their last breath from lung cancer. And I can tell you now that since I no longer smoke after 33 years of smoking, I don't get sick very often. I used to get cold three, four times a year. I don't get any now. Maybe one a year, if that. Um, I can tell you that I used to wake up with hacking coughs. I couldn't run. I couldn't jog. I would lose my wind easily. I now work out regularly in a fitness center, and I get on an elliptical, and I run endurance seven-minute miles in succession. I now run interval training at over 18 miles an hour for a minute straight. So, yes, I have held people in my arms. Yes, I have seen people get sick and die. Yes, I have seen people develop emphysema. A recent friend of mine just died who was a lifelong smoker. She tried to quit many, many times. I tried to introduce her to electronic cigarettes. She wasn't ready. And she just passed of emphysema at the age of 67 not two months ago. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just trying to get a, a sense, uh, you know, over this brief period of time that we've had information or some kind of experience with these products, how they would compare if cigarettes had only been available for three years or four years as well. I'm trying to get a sense of that with all due relative with, 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 with all due respect, ma'am, I, I don't see that as a relevant question. The fact is tobacco has been around for decades, and we promoted it. And we either regulated it or we didn't. And we allowed it to be advertised. And it, it has gone on and it has permeated our society to the point of not only being socially acceptable, but being socially attractive. And now today, it's become unattractive. But the damage is done. The chemicals are in the tobacco. And those chemicals are accelerated exponentially by the, car, the, the combustion process. And so we have a combination of habit patterns and addictions. And we have something that has permeated our society to the point where you've sat here all day long looking at statistics that show 43 million, 44 million people in this country smoking. With all of the increases in prices, with all the increases of taxes, with all the medical knowledge that we have and information that we have that says that this is deadly. This is destroying your life, and we do it again and again and again. And children still continue to do it because for some reason they get it in their heads that this is cool. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm not a tobacco specialist. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a doctor. But I am involved in this industry, and I see what's going on. And I see the hundreds of thousands of people that are actively participating every single day in the forums. There are right now 30 pages of forum posts that have been posted today during this hearing alone by people following what's going on in this room, live on the internet. People care. People need this. They want this. This is something we don't have enough proof, but we have enough proof to know that this, by comparison to tobacco, it's about to continue smoking, that NRTs, as, as yes, promote the NRTs, I'm not saying stop them, but they're not working enough. In six years, we've got five million people worldwide already using these products in one variation or another. We've got social environments and communities, support structures, that are evolving at a rate that I've never seen happen in any other facet of society. 
We have events that take place, four or five of them a year here in this country, where six, seven, eight, nine hundred people show up from around the world. People fly in from England. We've got doctors in Greece. Dr. Farsalonos was chosen. He was honored to be chosen for the European Society of Cardiology. I think there were thousands and thousands of different studies that were submitted to be presented at that cardiology event in August of 2012. And here was Dr. Farsalonos holding up a comparison on the cardiological impacts of tobacco versus vapor. And the study is posted on our website. The links are there. I encourage you, I beg you, go to our website. Look at this information. Is it enough? No, it's not. You have a responsibility. We have a responsibility. But the information's there. Yes, sir. Hi, I, I apologize for my ignorance. I don't know a lot about your organization. Um, and I'm just curious as to if you could maybe speak a little bit more about what you do. Um, I was interested in the core beliefs, and it talks about, you know, for example, verifying the accuracy of the nicotine content, the quality and safety of the ingredients, which is terrific stuff. Do, do you actually do any laboratory tests to check those kinds of things? or? Are there site inspections about the clean sanitary manufacturing facilities? I'm just curious as to how those yes, yes, go. and yes. Great. How do you all of you that just... is posted on our website? We believe in 100% transparency. Can you speak? now? While I am not a scientist, I do, I have been very active in leading and facilitating the formation of this process because I believe in it. And as I said, I'm a volunteer. I have no financial interest in this industry, but I do it because I care, and I see the need for regulation. Self-regulation aims. To, it could be a model. It could be an example. But we brought in a professional chemist, professor with over 30 years experience in biochemistry. And we brought in leading, we even have nicotine suppliers that are very well educated. And so we start down and we try to study and say, how do we isolate the top quality of the nicotine? We know that there's this variation, this, this range, a scale of quality of nicotine. We have pesticide grade. Do we want anybody using that? No. How do we get to the top? So we pulled quantitative GCMS tests. I had to go study what is a quantitative GCMS test versus a qualitative GCMS test. And I had to learn that there, in order to have an effective quantitative GCMS test, you have to build a library of all the potential contaminants. And then you have to create a baseline. Now we realized that this was cost prohibitive to do on an item by item, on a, on a supply level by supply level basis for per order for the manufacturers that are operating at our levels. They're small, small businesses. So what we realized was that there are certain nicotine suppliers that are doing this as a matter of course. They're already doing it on a batch level. So we started comparing the quantitative GCMS test, and we said, okay, well, we went and looked at the FDA requirements, and we said if it was going to be USP, if it was going to be, be, be certified, it would probably have to be 90, what did we come with, 99.5% pure, I think. And then we looked at the other guy and said, well, wait a second, there's nobody selling USP certified in the United States. There's nobody going to certify it here in the United States. We don't have that kind of money. But there are people that are doing USP grade. So we started looking at USP grade and we said, okay, 99%. And then we started looking at some very, very specific contaminant ratios within that 1%. And we talked to our nicotine suppliers. We talked to our professional chemist, subject matter expert. And we started isolating out very specific levels of contaminants. And you can see this on our website. It's all listed. All of our definitions are listed. So then from there, we went and we said, OK, well, we've got to go even further. We've got to verify that not only the quality, but we've got to follow the accuracy. So in that quantitative GCMS test, every single vendor, when they take in a batch, they have to titrate their incoming level. Now, none of them are bringing in pure, so they're bringing it in at some working level or something reduced closer to a working level. So they have to titrate, and they may even be bringing in their working level. So if it is coming from the supplier at, say, 100 milligrams, then the manufacturer, the vendor, that this, our, our member, has to have that titrated to verify the accuracy before he begins to subdilute it further. All diluents have to be USP certified through the chain of custody. They have to use NIST certified calibrated equipment to measure the nicotine. So there are steps. I mean, I, I can't rattle off our entire set of standards off my head, but they're there on our website. And they were based in a large extent off FDA commercial food regulations, commercial food manufacturing. 
Personally, I believe that some reasonable set of standards can be developed, maybe straddling uh, US uh, liquor distillation and commercial food handling. I mean, there's no doubt, nicotine is an, is an ingredient of concern. And for me to stand here and pretend that it isn't would not make much sense. It is. In its concentrated form, it requires professional handling and professional environments. There's no doubt about it. But in the level that it's diluted down, if you're using high quality ingredients, we have a whole list of ingredients we prohibit from being included in our members' in liquids. We've evaluated the FDA standards for the environment, the dedicated environment, non-porous surfaces, how we store chemicals and levels, how often hands have to be washed, hair standards, clothing standards, standards for abrasions. If somebody's sick, they have to report it to a person in charge, and they're not allowed in the mixing room for three asymptomatic days or until they're cleared by a medical professional, similar to that of commercial food handling. We've taken on the packaging issues, and we've gone into child-proof caps, tamper-resistance, tamper-evident packaging, smear-proof labels, batch ID numbers that are traceable on each bottle back to the incoming batch of nicotine. And yes, ma'am. Um, Eric, I didn't want to cut you off. Were you? Did you want to ask anything? Uh, my only other question. That, that's all extremely interesting. Um, so, if, to be a member of your organization, they have to meet the minimum standards you set. Is that? I'm just trying to figure out what they agree to. The, they, the standards are published. They agree to the standards. They sign a membership agreement. We're a very new organization. We have a set of charter members. We've had some recent additions. Um, nobody is actually required to be in compliance until January 15th, and the inspections will begin then. Every single member agrees to scheduled and unscheduled inspections. And how many members do you currently have, uh, roughly? I think the number is 13. Okay. But as I said, we only launched uh, October 8th, I believe. On item 4.6, in your comments, you, you went pretty quickly over what you think FDA and HHS agencies could do. I, I don't want you to go through all of what we could do and not maybe not focus on correcting what you see as we've been doing wrong, but perhaps say focus on what regulatory role you think the federal government should have, if any, um, for, for these types of products. Well, are you asking what role I think the government should have, or are you asking me how I think that these reasonable, realistic, and sustainable regulations can be formulated? Would you repeat the last part more slowly? <laughs> I'm, I'm asking you the nature of your question. Are you, is your question to me, what do I think the government's role should be in regulation, or are you asking me how I think these regulations should be formulated? Uh, I think it's the, the uh, how, how, what's the government's role in regulating this group of products? I think that the government is best served to work with those who are already extremely knowledgeable. You've got wonderful resources at your disposal. CASA, AIMSA has wonderful knowledgeable experts. There are other people in this room here today. Um, We've got Bill Godshaw. We've got Dr. Farsalanos in Greece who's willing to communicate and participate. We've got the Clearstream Project, um, Dr. Michael Siegel. I mean, there's a long list of people who have been actively involved and very knowledgeable, and we would be happy to facilitate and participate. And I think that the regulations could very well be developed, as I said, to perhaps maybe straddle. Um, and this is my opinion. I mean, I can't speak for the industry. I can only speak for our own manufacturers, for our members, for our association. But we believe as an association that reasonable, realistic, and sustainable standards might somehow cross the borderline between liquor distillation and commercial food manufacturing. That's what I was trying to get at. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for the time.